Michel Barnier says we could have a shortage of medicines in this country. The quarantine travel limitations in Heathrow at the moment, are they crazy? And Prince Andrew, what is happening to Prince Andrew? All this and more on The Voice of London. Well, it's another week, another day, another dollar, as they say in Parliament at the same time in UK. But this week, again, Michel Barnier, who heads up the EU to actually decide what's going to happen post-Brexit, he is saying that we are not talking to him, we are not talking to the people in Europe at all about how we want to have Brexit finalised. How crazy is this? at a time when we are facing a pandemic of virus. And now on top of this, the European government is saying, for goodness sake, start talking, start negotiating before it is too late. Now, what he's really saying at the moment, Barnier, is that the reality is a lot of the medicines that we use in Britain, even things like paracetamol, are from Europe and come through Europe as well. And there may become a shortage of these types of drugs and medicines if we don't have a secure deal with the EU. Now, it is being said at the moment that the British government is playing hardball. After what is happening at the moment with the pandemic, I don't think they're playing any ball at all, quite honestly. I wonder what is happening. First of all, I think they've really not been that clear about what's going to happen uh, post the lockdown situation and how we're going to come out with that. And at the same time, they think they can play hardball again. These hardball politicians can play again with the EU. Well, just think about it. We may be facing the longest and deepest depression we have ever faced in Britain financially. Who are we going to trade with? Who are we going to trade with? 64% of our trade before lockdown was still with the EU. So if we now create no deal situations, which is what a lot of politicians have feared, and the people who fought Brexit have feared as well at the end of this year, where are we going to go then? So it could mean all sorts of tariffs happening, all sorts of situations happening, and now we're still saying, America, America is going to be our big saviour. Well, hang on a minute, America's going to go into an even deeper depression by the sound of it as well. And how are they going to come out of it? They're going to spend up to three trillion to spend themselves out of this situation. This morning, we are in talks with Japan, talking about trade deals as well. But I want to get a grip, for goodness sake, Boris Johnson, get a grip in all these situations that I see at the moment. And I feel quite honestly, we're absolutely almost like walking in dreamland right now. We're sleepwalking through all these situations. So I want to see how Michel Barnier and the British government can come together. Let's get a great deal. Let's not have a deal where it may sort of uh, see some people benefiting, perhaps Tory Conservatives benefiting from this, who knows? I want to see Great Britain becoming great again. And when you sort of see the opportunities and the downsides of what's happening at the moment, we need every positive lead, every positive person in Europe to work with us as well. That's my feeling. And now we move from uh, really one storm to another storm, the coronavirus at the moment. Now, we've had good news uh, in London in the past few days is that zero new uh, of, of these uh, coronavirus 
epidemic, people are coming into our hospitals. So zero new cases have been found at the moment uh, on the pandemic in London. And hopefully this will be happening in other parts of the country as well. Now, Matt Hancock, the health secretary, is saying we are below one in our numbers uh, all the way through the country. Other metro uh, people are sort of saying across their areas, the metro mayors are sort of saying across their areas, especially in the northwest, that we're above one. So that means epidemic could be coming out again. So how is Matt Hancock, how is Boris Johnson going to deal with all of this situation at the moment? They are saying that uh, tech, track and trace is the way forward. The test, track and tracing is their opportunity to shine. Now, the whole opportunity of having an app was supposed to have been here on the 1st of June. Seven days later, we still haven't seen this. And although they have got 22,000 test, track and tracers, how many of them are actually working at the moment and are actually testing, tracking and tracing at the same time? For, for me, I wonder where the British government is right now. Are we being governed at all or are we having sound judgment or just purely sound bites from these different ministers and the prime minister as well? And where is the prime minister anyway? He just seems to be taking really, perhaps I, I can understand that he is suffering from the coronavirus, but if he is not capable of being a leader, perhaps he should relinquish the role and let someone else take over the whole responsibility right now. But at least one positive thing is, as we have said already, although there are still deaths, the deaths are going down at the moment across the country and there have no more reported cases of coronavirus in London. Now, we go from one comedy error to another. The quarantine that's been started yesterday at Heathrow and all the major airports in Britain. What this means now is that people are coming into Britain and they have to sign a form beforehand to tell them, British authorities, where are they going to stay? And then as they come through, they are then told, you now have to go into self-isolation. Now, a lot of people were coming through, one gentleman from Switzerland yesterday, another from Germany, and he is saying, what on earth are you talking about? No one has told us about anything like this at all. Yet they are expected to actually go into quarantine, face masks, the full thing. Now, that sounds okay. Um, this may be able to sort of happen. Now, if you think through, how are they going to travel to the, their place of stay during this period of time? <clears throat> Excuse me. So the reality is, is that they're going to use public transport. So they could be coronavirus sufferers themselves, and they could be careering through our public transport systems to get to their place of lockdown. Are they allowed to go out? Are they allowed to get food? Are they allowed to be able to sort of do things like this? No, no, no. Okay. So now three of the airlines are now sort of saying at the moment, BA, EasyJet and Ryanair are taking the government to court. They're saying this is legal interventions par excellence. So I have to sort of say at the moment, a lot of um, uh, experts are saying this was far too late anyway. And in some places it is thought, believe it or not, alleg allegations is that this uh, lockdown, this quarantine, is actually supposed to hit Europe so we can actually play hardball with Brexit. Because then European people will have to spend two weeks in quarantine as well. Are we becoming crazy in this country? What is happening in this country, for goodness sakes, at the moment? I, I see the whole situation. It's almost like we are creating laws on the hoof. We're doing knee-jerk reactions. So we have this quarantine issue. A lot of experts are saying this is a crazy idea. What it means as well is, is that it actually stops a lot of people who may want to come in from certain countries to actually experience our tourism and open up our tourist industry again. 
they're not going to come so they can spend two weeks in lockdown, first of all, to be able to do it. So again, I asked the British government, for goodness sake, think things through carefully. Stop doing knee-jerk reactions. Stop doing sound bites that, for me, I cannot see the sense behind them. I can understand quarantine for certain people. But there are uh, areas like thermal image cameras right now that can actually detect heated bodies. And then if anybody comes across with that type of symptom as they're coming through, they can be stopped and checked that way. Much simpler, much quicker, and a much better way of actually ensuring that Britain starts staying open and starts working again. Now, we look at uh, the uh, entertainment industry and uh, the different industries, and there is one positive sign for people who like their pint of beer, and that pubs are going to reopen from the 22nd of June. Now, I look at this at the moment and I think, OK, uh, according to uh, certain brewery groups, they've created uh, social isolating in pubs. I'm not sure how that's going to happen. And if people have too much to drink, are they going to be able and are the pubs are going to be able to actually make sure this is adhered to as well? I understand that the whole of the entertainment industry, the, the hotels, the bars, the clubs, everybody is crying out, as is uh, all the areas of tourism as well in London and across this country. We have to be able to do it safely and perhaps hopefully they have found methods of actually managing to be able to do this. I hope so. You know, Britain wants to be able to reopen but we want it to reopen in safety. The government keeps on saying, we follow the science. Hello, a lot of the scientists are saying they're not following the science anymore at all. They're just making their own political agenda. So let's have a look at it. Let's just see how this works. I hope the 22nd of June uh, um, that people will respect social distancing as well. And I hope they will raise a glass to Great Britain. That's the idea behind it. And talking about Great Britain, what else other than the royal family? And uh-oh, here we go again. Prince Andrew is back in the news again. Last week I was talking about Prince Andrew and how uh, with his wife Sarah Ferguson they had bought a Swiss chalet and were now being allegedly sued for £6.7 million. Pounds. Well, <laughs> I laugh at this because, as people know, I'm a royal commentator and a royal correspondent as well. And I wonder what our hapless prince is going to do next. So again, this is coming from the other side, from the United States, from lawyers who are trying to find out what happened about Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, and what was the prince's association with him allegations of paedophilia, allegations of um, sexual affairs happening in certain parts of uh, Jeffrey Epstein's buildings, where allegedly, again, Prince Andrew was staying at the same time. I say allegedly because in reality, although images have been shown of him with a young girl, he is still vehemently saying he either never knew her or he can't remember ever meeting her at all. That's his side of the story. So what's going to happen with Prince Andrew at the moment? Well now this legal case is flying backwards and forwards and the reality is that the Department of Justice in the United States have asked for a legal assistance order to be served on Prince Andrew. What happens with this and um, Jeffrey Epstein? I do not know. But again, is this the right type of image for the royal family right now to be, be seen in at a time like this, when all the other members of the royal family, including the Queen, have been doing so many good works, especially on Skype calls right now, really bringing and uplifting the nation for us. 
So that's my take on the news of today. And uh, we're not going to take a short break. Stay with us. And in the second half of the show, uh, we will talk about Black Lives Matter. See you again soon. Hello and welcome back to the second part of the show, Voice of London, with me, Ian Penham Turner on ALB UK Television and PositiveBritain.co.uk. And now with broadcaster and writer Buki Alafemi. Welcome back! Thank you. Thanks for having me. Buki used to be a regular on the show until lockdown, and at long last we're back. The team is coming together <laughs> again. Do. But we have something very serious uh, to talk about today because obviously. Um, I feel this channel should be supporting black people as well. Uh, black lives certainly do matter at the same time. And first of all, give me your take on what you've seen over the past few days. Um, I think there's been a uprising and upset and um, just a sadness upon amongst people and um, I think it's almost been felt like enough is enough and something needs to be done and out of that um, you know protests have arisen not just in London but I believe in uh, Manchester in Brighton um, there's been a lot of uproar in what we've seen happening in America and people have felt things that need to be done and um, we're seeing that in the ramifications um, of protests with a bubble over of emotions um, about the injustice. What do you think about this Bristol statue as well? How do you, yeah. how do you feel about that? Well, honestly, um, I was actually quite surprised. And when I first saw it, I didn't, I thought it was actually abroad. I thought it was an American statue. I didn't know that such statues and what it represents with oppression and injustice and slavery. It was a slave, it was the statue of a slave owner. Yeah. And I, I was quite shocked that it was actually still standing mm. knowing what it represents um you know i do not condone um property being um dismantled vandalized but the fact that that the, what it stands for and uh, you mm. know the symbol what it stands for the fact that it's still openly um just upheld it you know that that's something that needs to be questioned in itself so it was and and you know if you looked at the community and who was pulling it down it you know it was majority of it it was people from bristol it was caucasian people and it just goes to show you you know that not everyone you know, there was a bubbling over of emotions and people are, they don't want these, they're not happy for these sort of things to be standing. And that's why it was removed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, for me, I don't condone um, property being dismantled, but something like that should have been removed a long time ago. Mm. Yeah. And when you look at the history, because a lot of people don't know this, but um, when the repeal of slavery happened in the 1850s, 1860s in Britain, all the potential slave owners and a large percentage of slave owners who had slaves in America and the West Indies were actually clergymen. Mm. They, were, they were English clergymen. Right. Um, and they were paid uh, the equivalent today of eight, 800 million pounds. That's right. Um, to actually, uh, so that they wouldn't suffer financially for it. And that's what actually fueled a lot of the Industrial Revolution that recharged Britain uh, as it was later in that century. 
For me, it's abhorrent, first of all. Uh, I've fought uh, black issues all my life. Um, for me, the colour of someone's mm. skin is irrelevant. Yeah. It's the person that they are that is most important. For me, <clears throat> what I like to sort of feel, and I hope it's going to happen more, is that the rhetoric that comes out now really talks up black people and what they have actually contributed to Britain. Of course. And I think that is very, very important. Uh, and I was just telling you just before we came on the show about uh, a couple of years ago when I was doing another item for another TV mm -hmm. channel. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, this was to do with the Queen's uh, honours list sure. uh, and how a missive had come out from Buckingham Palace to say that at least 10% of, um, of uh, recipients yeah. from now on would be black. And I'm thinking, this is crazy. Yeah. I, I mean, to me, um, I feel that this dishonoured the honour system in the yeah. first place yeah. because it should be irrelevant of yeah. colour. You know, it should be who yeah. you are and what you're doing. And when you look at, and I know um, two of your family are doctors as well, mm. when you look at the amount of effort mm. that black people have done in frontline services yeah. during this epidemic and have died because of it, and they still haven't worked out why they've died as well, I wonder where Britain is today. Yeah, definitely. You know? So what type of things do you feel are necessary now to actually create um, a new Britain? I hope as we come out of lockdown, my ho greatest hope mm. is we become a kinder Britain. Yeah. That people don't expect so much in material goods anymore, mm. but they respect other people. So what type of things do you think will really help Britain coming out of lockdown? Um, to be honest with you, um, will you when you have things that are bubbling over in terms of racial tensions and you know it's all these things that we are protesting about you for me it's uh, we've got to go back to the root cause and it's uh, this idea it's this I, I believe it's just systematic racism and that's where it can be um that's where you can draw it back to now um it, it you know it's existent in um a lot of big areas of our life and and it includes um education there's you can see huge disparities in family wealth in education and um, access to career opportunities um you know it's also in the injustice uh, in the criminal justice system as well you can see biases where um um, you know, your formal. Th there's four times as many people, uh, black people, that are jailed than their white counterparts. And the things that causes this, again, further down, is implicit biases. And this is biases within our community that we have and hold without knowing. So it can be in areas from um, biases with different communities, um, where as some people might believe that uh, it's things like people believe in that Muslim. Uh, uh, you know, I, ISIS are uh, you know related um, caused by Muslims, or that uh, blacks are are lazy, or they're usually um, uh, drug dealers. I think it comes down to our own individual biases. When we can um, pinpoint and be aware that we have biases, and um, just make it our own responsibility to you know to just um, address that and to be accountable for different biases because it plays a role in terms of education it plays a role in terms of jobs and careers and opportunities for ethnic minorities you know um, I think these are the things that we can help to just eradicate and reduce this I think once these things are done we can see changes yeah I remember uh, asking a lot of my black friends, and I ask it for you today, do you feel like a first class citizen in Britain? Um, honestly, it's, it's, it comes and it goes, it's intermittent. There's times where you do feel like you're part of the community and you're British and you know, and all these things that come with that, but then it's stripped away and you're brought back again to reality when you do face uh, racial discrimination, when there is profiling, when there is bias, and then, you're remem and then you remember that actually there seems to be a different system for you than there is for other non-blacks yeah mm. so it's quite sad in the way because 
Yeah. And, and, and one of the best things that I noticed uh, in the past few days, um, there were scenes uh, of demos in London yeah. where people um, were all age groups, all races were throwing things at the police. Um, and the thing that really got to me was that two or three black girls ran in between all these bot bottles being thrown and try to stop the crowd mm. because they were saying this is not the way to do this yeah I admire those girls tremendously mm. just for even doing that because that could have brought them harm at the same time they were in what we call no man's land they were between the police sure. lines yeah. and the demonstrator lines mm. as well and so I, I really admire that yeah. for, for me um, I'd like to see a lot more uh, black awards. I'd like to see a lot more black people highlighted for what they're doing. Mm. I think it's very, very important. Uh, I don't mean from an honours list because I think the honours list a lot of the time uh, has been affected mm. by mm. all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it is time for black people to be respected a lot more and Asian people as well. People of colour, colour yeah. you know, because, you know, um, if you look at uh, sports people, mm. we wouldn't be uh, in one of the highest places in the world in athletics right now mm. if it wasn't for black people, mm. you know. And, and for me, I'm ashamed to, and I said to you mm. earlier, I find it very hard to call anyone black. Yeah, I, you I said really that. do. Yeah. It, 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 it is very hard for me because I'm thinking, why do I even um, go with the view that I have to distinguish you from someone else mm -hmm. when I don't believe in it mm -hmm. in the first place? Mm -hmm. So how, how can we actually sort of um, find ways, levels, platforms for people now uh, of colour, whatever their denomination, to, act, to actually highlight them and their good works? Um, well, in terms of like the entertainment, it yeah. could be anything because yeah. you know, as, as you know, I mean, your father and your brother mm. are doctors. Yeah, sure. Who congratulates them? <laughs> well, in that case, then I guess it's representation in every industry, in every sector. I mean, um, it, it was something that struck me actually was like, you know, even the campaigns for stay at home and, and praising the NHS, uh, NHS and, you know, where we were clapping for the NHS. Um, it's fun, um, I, it struck me that even in the adverts, there wasn't any representation of a diverse workforce that were at the work at the forefront the doctors the nurses the key workers it seemed to show sort of um, just one it was just made predominantly Caucasians and and I think it's this idea that um, it is the, the lack of sort of um, representation really to congratulate to to, uh, to to just thank and to applaud um, who's helping us it's 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 you know we're built up of a team of people and melting pot mm. of, of different races and uh, maybe it's um, representation yeah yeah and, and I remember years ago in fact probably when I first really started uh, working with black communities yeah. was probably about 10 years ago yeah. and I was at a dinner party one night and we were talking about equality sure. um, to one of my West Indian uh, couple friends um, at the time um, and, uh, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, I, I hope today, uh, as you know, I'm a great feminist, I fight female yeah, issues all right. day long as well. Uh, and uh, we, we touched on the subject of colour at the same time. And the thing that shocked me, and I think the, the first thing that made me think, what on earth is going on in Britain today, was um, uh, the fact that uh, Caribbean, maybe African families as well, parents, tell their siblings mm. they must work twice as hard as any white person 
That's true. To become successful. Yeah. To me, that's the most hurtful thing I ever heard. Yeah. I, well, you know, I've, we, we're told it too, you know, um, Afro and Caribbean households, um, because the reality is um, parents, they know what, um, they know how the system is and they know the half realities of um, what, you know, different steps that we're going to go through. So, and um, there is bias, there is discrimination, there is, you know, all of these things. And for that reason, and you have to, you are told and you do work towards making yourself work twice as hard, three times as hard to be recognised, to access um, opportunities as other, you know, other races. And it's, it's, it's you know, it, it sounds terrible, but it, it's, it's, it's normality really yeah. for us. Yeah. And you accept it. See, that's the yeah. problem. Yeah. That's the problem. And I think, you know, the, the reality these days is, is when I look at, as I say, you know, uh, a large percentage of uh, black people um, uh, really have great qualifications. Yeah. They are doing great things yeah. for Britain as well. And, and the thing that I don't understand about Britain is whenever a community comes into Britain, so we're on an Albanian channel today yeah. as well, yeah. Albanians again are criticised mm. and yet the, a large proportion mm. of them, 99% of Albanians in Britain are hard working, yeah. they bring resources into Britain, they bring their great skills mm. and their community affairs into Britain as well, which are fabulous. I don't understand why British people criticise incoming communities. I don't get it. I don't understand why. Because for me, uh, I feel that any incoming community brings great values to the country as well how do you think about that um yeah i totally agree you know um they bring so much a wealth for me i feel like a lot of we depend on a lot of um minorities and other races who help even down to our our, our food and you know um there was a call not so long ago um from from britain to appeal to european um, workers to come and pick the the summer the, the summer fruits and yeah. the summer harvest and to pick that so even down to things like uh, from food to um education to to, um, you know, healthcare, we do rely heavily on other races, and um, and it's the and they are integral to our society and the way we function as as a society. So it's um, it is sad that it, you know, our, despite all of this, they're still sort of looked down at on a on a certain way when in fact we all need each other. Yeah. And I, I would say I, I know there's a there's a, an unemployment problem amongst black people mm. at times but a large percentage are hard working you know it's like uh, the East Europeans the Albanians um, there's very few people who rely on any state system at all yeah, they're that's all right. trying to work when they can work as well so finally because uh, time is yeah. beating us today uh, and we will have you back regularly yeah. please um, as we come out of lockdown for, for me I want to see a happier Britain. What is one thing that we could do to make Britain happier? I think we have to be um, kinder to each other. We have to hold each other accountable because a lot, I, I really truly believe it comes down to bias, our way of looking at the world, our, our, our prejudice that we may not even be aware that we have from, you know, um, from education to career opportunities. Um, you know, it, it says that, um, you know, free, uh, your free times, um, more like less likely to get a call back if you have um a foreign name it's and it comes down to biases i think if we can all do a part to just make sure that we um just refrain for having notions of different ethnic minorities um and, and negative con um, connotations to people dependent from where they come from i think if we were to just be a bit more kinder a bit more courteous in these areas i think it would really make a big difference all round yeah you make a great big difference anyway whenever you come on screen so thank, thank you, you so, so much. much again and we look forward to having you regularly back on the show and we can talk up black people in Britain Brentford. which is one of my you know biggest ambitions thank Bookie, you so thank much. you so much thank you for having me
So for me, Ian Pelham Turner on ALB UK Television and PositiveBritain.co.uk, can I ha say have a great day from the Voice of London? I hope you're enjoying the shows at the moment. Really, we are commentating on the things that are in the news that I feel need to be highlighted a lot more. So from Buki and myself, have a great day and we will be doing more shows this week. Take care and bye for now.